coming up on Chopper's Politics. We will begin to flex our democratic muscles. For 40 years, our parliament has been subjugated by Brussels. You know, it's like someone who's getting back to the gym. It's a bit painful at first and you don't really know <laughs> what you're doing. Muscle memory comes back. Your muscle memory eventually comes back and then you're winning the race. I'm Christopher Hope, Associate Editor of The Daily Telegraph, and this is Chopper's Politics, coming to you from the Red Lion Pub in Westminster. Well, the sun is shining and the glorious weather will have many of us thinking about upcoming summer holidays. But it will break soon, and thunderstorms are forecast across England this weekend. And so it follows that Boris Johnson's government has been having more of its own difficulties this week. For a start, the government failed to deport migrants to Rwanda following its own government policy after an intervention from judges on the European Court of Human Rights. And then towards the end of the week, Number 10 was rocked by the news that Lord Guite, who, as Sir Christopher Guite, used to advise the Queen for 10 years on constitutional and political issues, suddenly resigned. That was the second ethics advisor to resign for number 10 in just less than two years. No wonder William Ragg, the chairman of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, told The Telegraph, for the PM to lose one advisor on ministers' interests may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose two looks like carelessness. So I thought, who better to ask about this than Suella Braverman, the government's attorney general? She joined me this week at my regular table in the Red Lion Pub. Swella Braveman, welcome to Chopper Politics in the Red Lion Pub. Great to have you here on a busy day. It's always a busy day, but I will always make time for you, Christopher. Now, I'm going to ask you the one question which all our listeners want to answer to. Who is in charge of our courts, British judges or European judges? That is a great question. And a lot of people will be rightly wondering why at literally what felt like the 59th minute of the 11th hour on Tuesday night, just before the flight to Rwanda was about to take off, a ruling from a European court, a foreign court, a decision made, reached by foreign judges, has uh, operated to thwart British policymaking to stop the Home Office from deploying one of our national priorities. That's really hard to understand for many because we are out of the European Court of Justice, but we're not out of the European Court of Human Rights. That's a difference. Yeah. And I think that actually many people have been in touch with me from my constituency, just to put it in simple terms, saying, I thought we'd left the EU. What's happening? I thought we sorted this all out in 2016. And unfortunately, you and I know and that the EU is a very separate and distinct legal and constitutional and political entity to the Council of Europe, from which flows the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, which made the decision. Which we signed up to in 1998 with the Human Rights Act. Well, we actually are signatories to the European Convention of Human Rights, and we've been signatories to it since the you know, 1950s. Mm. But it became enforceable in law, didn't it? Something changed in 1998, didn't it? In 1998, the Human Rights Act was introduced uh, and passed by the Labour administration. It came into force to, as they said at the time, bring rights home. And it essentially enabled the convention rights to be invoked in domestic courts. Previously, uh, you would have to go to the Strasbourg court physically, effectively, to actually rely on convention rights. What's next? Should we leave it? Well, I think the government is definitely very disappointed by the decision on Tuesday and we're considering all options. I think what is clear is that there are some questionable bases for the decision reached on Tuesday. I think we're looking at all options in terms of how we might be able to challenge this interim order. But more broadly, I think there are real problems with the European Court of Human Rights. It's expansionist, it's politicised, it's taken an interpretation of the original 1950 convention, which doesn't bear resemblance to the original intention of those drafters in 1950. And I don't think it necessarily reflects Flex, British values. So I'm not going to announce any major no, policy we, we, uh, no, decision we're today. Anything. We're in a pub, you know. I should tell you before we started that the words "all options" are banned in a pub. <laughs> What, 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 what might, I mean, can we leave it? Can we leave this? Uh... Telling you and six million listeners, no, no one's Chris. listening. It's just Louisa in the corner recording it. Listen, I, I've been in discussions with a lot of ministers on looking at our relationship with the European Court yeah. of Human Rights. And I'm going to utter the dreaded words, but all options are on the table. But what I would say is this isn't a new issue. And the government is very alive to the problems caused by our membership of the European Convention of Human Rights. And that's why we ordered an independent review. And 
and then we had a consultation and the Lord Chancellor Dominic Raab is going to be proposing a bill very soon which is going to reform the Human Rights Act in quite significant ways to increase our margin of appreciation in the UK. That means uh, more power to UK courts to make their decisions. That wouldn't stop the courts intervening in the flights taking off. Well, I'm not sure about that. I think the jury's out on what would have happened if we were in a Bill of Rights world. But I think that the measures which will be announced very soon will really attempt to deal head on with some of the problems caused by the expansionist and disproportionate Mm. interpretation of the convention. Human rights give you the right to dignity and old age for pensioners in in a care home, for example. Human rights are a good thing. You can agree that, can't you? I mean, I'm not going to disagree with that at all. Human rights, civil liberties is a tradition which runs through our justice. Exactly, and we can't really lecture lecture other countries about human rights if we withdraw from this convention ourselves. Well, why not be more exact, like with prisoner voting, when the ECHR moved against that in 2004, and then in 2017, UK government moved to ban prisoners having a vote. Why not do that with random flights? Well, I think there is a a real possibility of that happening post the introduction of an application of the measures that the Lord Chancellor is going to be announcing. The prisoner voting issue was the case of Hearst, but that really illustrated over a period of over 10 years, <laughs> the tension between Strasbourg and the UK and our English courts. That, as I said, has been represented in many, many other areas, in many other cases relating to other articles of the convention. And I'm no way advocating a slash and burn approach to human rights. I actually think that the UK or the English common law has a very rich heritage and tradition of protecting civil liberties, of curbing the limits of executive or prerogative power in the name of individual rights. We were one of the brains behind the 1950 convention. So I don't think we need to be lectured to by judges from other civil code jurisdictions where they have a very different approach to legal reasoning. We have a clash of legal cultures, I believe. Mm. That was a problem in the CJEU as part of our membership with the EU. I think it's also a problem running through our participation in the European Court of Human Rights. Can the policy work, do you think? Because 5,500 people have come across the channel since the announcement in April. I think the policy can work. I believe our policy is lawful. I mean, we spent the best part of a year passing legislation, the Nationality and Borders Act, to empower the Home Office to take greater steps in the fight against illegal migration. And the arrangement with Rwanda has a legal basis in the statute. We've reached that international agreement with the Rwandans and hasn't been determined to be unlawful yet. That substantive challenge will take place uh, next month by way of judicial review. I think we need to wait and see what the courts say, but I'm very confident that we have a very strong case that it is a lawful policy and can work. How do you feel about doing this? You know, you, your, your parents, Christy and Uma Fernandez of Indian origin, came here from Kenya and Mauritius in the 1960s. How do you feel about finding ways to stop further immigration coming here? That's a good question. My mother came here from Mauritius in the 1960s as an 18-year-old girl recruited by the NHS. She's very proud of of that. Tory councillor in Brent? She was a Tory councillor. She stood for Parliament, actually, herself. She had a go twice unfortunately, unsuccessfully. And my father came here, he was effectively exiled as a Kenyan Asian in the 1960s. And it was a British, he always tells me, he stepped off the plane at Heathrow Airport on a cold February morning in 1968. Again, he, I think he was about 20, by himself, no family, no friends, a young man. Extraordinary. And it was his British passport that had been issued to him by the British government that was his symbol of hope. And it always brings a tear to my eye. And he started on the shop floor of a paint factory and he made his home and his life here in Britain, never actually went back. So why deny that to people coming here across the channel? Well, I don't think we are denying that right to people. And we have an amazing tradition, not just the story of my parents, but the story of millions of people who have come to this country, who have sought a better life, who have sought refuge, security and uh, opportunity. And uh, you only have to look around the cabinet table. And I think it's a great reflection of modern day Britain, which also is a big reminder of that great heritage that we have of welcoming people in search of refuge uh, in the United Kingdom. I don't think the policy on the illegal boats crossing the channel is at odds 
with that tradition and our very proud policy and record to date of welcoming thousands of people from Hong Kong, thousands of people from other war-torn countries, whether it's Afghanistan. So it's, it's legal migration it's is the It's legal point. migration and making your claim for asylum through a legal route, not getting on uh, a dinghy, an unseaworthy, dangerous, overcrowded dinghy in Calais, paying thousands of pounds to an illicit people smuggler who will be conducting criminal activity and exploiting these vulnerable people and then taking your life in your own hands to cross one of the busiest shipping routes in the world and then to then get here and, and try and recast your claim in a legal And, and your form. parents would understand that, wouldn't they? They wouldn't see it as being... Yes, my parents did not come here illegally. They went through legal routes and the proper processes in place in the 1960s. And we have those. And I, and I don't think our policy on asylum or migration can be challenged uh, for being cruel or harsh. Quite the contrary. I mean, surely just find on that question, if you are resorting to people smugglers, you're desperate. You really are desperate. You want to come here. Do you understand that desperation that they may be feeling? Well, well, the other factor is that they're coming here from a safe country. They're coming here from countries like France. Um, these are humane countries, signatories to the ECHR, members of the EU and other international, meet other international standards. I would in no way suggest that France is a cruel or inhumane country. And so I think there's a reason that um, we have to look at the pull factors in the UK as the to black why... black economy here where you can work without any trace of being here. Well, the reality is that you can... And I, and I actually, before I was an MP, I specialised in uh, immigration law, defending the Home Office day in, day out in court... Uh, and I did see that people do come here because they can access healthcare, they can access uh, education. And the rules are hideously complicated, I have to say, which makes a lot of opportunity, actually, to try and play those rules. Now, in, in your job in Attorney General, normally 80% of what you do is not known by journalists, and it shouldn't be because it's, it's important stuff. It might be involving police and, and challenging cases which you can't talk about. But you're in the news a lot at the moment, aren't you? <laughs> which shows how political your job is becoming at the moment, whether you like it or not. Northern Ireland Protocol, that's the, one of the big issues that started up this week and late last week. Um, are you comfortable with how that's ended up? Are you comfortable with it's legal, what the government's proposing about this treaty with the European Union? And... Part of the secrecy around the role of the Attorney General <laughs> is because of the uh, Law Officers' Convention. And I take the Law Officers' Convention incredibly seriously. It must be right that there is a boundary on what can be talked about and disclosed, similar to privilege and confidential that you see at the top of any legal letter or letter from your lawyer. And the Law Officers' Convention means that the fact of uh, or the content of legal advice being procured by any government minister it must remain secret. And so we don't talk about it. So uh, well, that said, <laughs> having we, know, said that, we know you've offered advice. The, the, on go that. the government legal position has been set out publicly, quite unusually, because this is a, an issue of importance. And the government legal position has been set out publicly on the Northern Ireland Protocol. And there, we've set out why we think the measures that we're proposing are lawful. We base that on two grounds, necessity. The doctrine of necessity has been recognised by the International Court of Justice. It's reflected in the International Law Commission. That means articles. because the effect on Northern Ireland peace process and, and, and peace in Northern Ireland and businesses there. That's the issue of necessity. It essentially allows a party, a state party, to a, an international agreement to depart from their obligations contained in that treaty if there are serious problems affecting uh, an essential interest. So that's a convoluted way of saying in Northern Ireland where we see the collapse of political institutions, where we see traders being prohibited and stopped, frankly, from trading in a particular route within their own country, where we see a dislocation felt by one community over another where we see profoundly the thwarting and strain placed upon the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, the foundation of peace and stability. We argue that, that those are all essential interests of the United Kingdom. They are in a grave situation and that's justified us in terms of taking the measures proposed. That, that is without prejudice to the Article 16 legal basis, which is, of course, a contained in the protocol itself, which again reflects the fact that at the time of ratification and agreement, both parties realised that there may well be a possibility that unilateral safeguard measures may be necessary uh, and provided for that circumstance expressly in the treaty. Were you upset when the advice from Sir James Eady, who was the first Treasury Council, was leaked last week? Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on leaks. <laughs> again, uh, the, the... Not site, even uh, the Red Lion pub. I mean, plenty of leaks happen here. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can't comment on leaks, but any leak is damaging. And I was very disappointed. But what I can say is Sir James E.D. QC is an incredibly experienced and indomitable. And he's been uh, consulted. I can't really confirm no, the process confirm or I'm not, I, I can't talk about the sausage machine that is okay, behind okay. the production of legal advice. Do you think though, that the fact it was leaked shows that some people in, in the government are working against you in trying to get this clarity on, on Northern Ireland? What I will say is Sir James E.D. is leading our litigation strategy and leading our legal team. So I, I can say that. And that's, yes, that's not unusual. True. <laughs> and he often represents the government in court. And Are the forces uh, working against a deal in Northern Ireland? Listen, there's a variety of views. I think, on the subject in government and outside government. That's clear for everybody to see. But I think that ultimately the Prime Minister, and it's his view that really counts, is cognizant of the problems. And as a Conservative and Unionist Prime Minister, will not want to see the breakup of his country in this way. And I think that the proposed measures are targeted, they're specific, they're very technical. This is not ripping up the protocol. It's not scrapping the protocol. We're retaining the aspects that are working. And this is a measured response that I think actually, you say, you know, is there, are there forces working against? I actually think this could work to unite the party. I actually think the decision to take this action is a great opportunity for us as Conservatives of MPs from all over the country to stand up for our United Kingdom. And you can see that from the support that uh, Sir Robert Buckland QC has set out very Remainer. extensively. A Remainer, exactly. And someone who set out quite fully his reasons for supporting the measures proposed. So do you think, is there a political divide in line, do you think, on this, that one party is pro-union and the other one isn't? I think you could say that, actually. Labour's failure to support these measures is a great reflection of their failure to stand up for the union. And I think that actually this should transcend red or blue. This should actually command cross-party support because this is about our country. Uh, And I don't think this is about Brexit. I don't think this is about left or right. I think this is doing the right thing to keep our country intact and to respect the integrity of the United Kingdom. Your Brexiteer credentials are impeccable. You're a former chairman of the European Research Group of Tory MPs. You're one of 28 Conservative MPs who refuse to back any of the three iterations of Theresa May's Brexit deal. Do you worry that Brexit is under threat at the moment? No, I'm very proud of the achievement that we secured. And when I say we, that's a very large group of people. I credit the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, for delivering Brexit when others had failed um, and breaking that deadlock in Parliament in 2019 through his negotiation with the EU. That's all in the past now. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm thinking... If you guys can't show the benefits of Brexit in the next two years, if you can't deliver on the promise of what Brexit could be, that it still is seen as a a problem, not an opportunity by so many people. If Labour get in in two years' time, it all falls apart. Well, I think we've got it enshrined in statute and actually we've seen a lot of the benefits of Brexit so far. I think the vaccine rollout, is a great example of the magnificent things this country can achieve when it's liberated. Arguably the most important thing the government's done in the past two years or three years has been that. Right. Right. A direct benefit of Brexit. And we've seen, of course, with, with Ukraine. We were able to move faster, where the EU has been conflicted and compromised and ambivalent for a variety of reasons, one of them being the constraints of the EU legal order, but there are many others, for example, their dependence on Russian oil and gas. But we have been able, we were able to take the lead and move ahead on sanctioning particular individuals and entities um, in a way that the EU wasn't. But there's a whole load of uh, opportunities that are set for us to grasp. There's been talk about a Remainer plot to reverse Brexit. Is there one? Speaking from the inside, not that I'm aware of. And if there is one, they're concealing it very effectively. I I feel very proud to be part of this administration led by Boris Johnson. I I really feel when I sit around that cabinet table, the passion for a liberated sovereign Britain, a passion for parliamentary democracy, a passion for taking back control, a real sense that Brexit was all about fighting for the British people, fighting for British traditions, fighting for self-government. And so I I feel that's the dominant culture within cabinet and within government. But not in the media. 
I mean, I saw on Wednesday night you said to Robert Peston that he's a, um, a Ramona or, or a Remain or whatever you called him. I, mean, I called him think- a Romaniac. A Romaniac, <laughs> Sorry. that's right. Sorry, Robert. <laughs> yeah, sure I didn't mind. Did, did you think there's a bias in the media against Brexit? I do think there is that, yes. I think there is sour grapes in parts of the media, I have to say. That's uh, not something the Telegraph suffers from, but definitely. <laughs> and I did, I did say this straight to the BBC when I was interviewed recently. I do believe that the BBC has a bias towards towards the EU, works on a, an assumption that the EU is always right and the UK is always wrong, works on an assumption that our approach to migration is cruel and heartless, works on an assumption that this government is somehow bad and every the rest of the world is really good. You know, people go on about our international reputation and how it's going to be damaged fatally by things like Brexit and our policy on Rwanda. There, you know, I've just come back from Ukraine, where I met with the prosecutor general there and the Ukrainians there love Britain. They love Boris. Uh, Our international reputation amongst many of our partners, not just countries that we're helping in conflict, is incredibly, incredibly high. They see us as uh, pioneering. Boris Johnson, the UK, has commanded respect. Uh, We've just joined when it comes to war crimes with Ukraine, the US and the EU on an atrocity crimes advisory board. They wouldn't work with us if they thought our international reputation was lacking. Our courts are renowned for for fairness. That's why people take legal action in this country, because of the idea you get a fair hearing. George Osborne this week said he he can foresee a set of economic arrangements with the EU, which aren't too distant from the ones we had when we were in the EU within 20 years. Is he right? He's wrong. He's absolutely wrong, because I think step by step, we will begin to flex our democratic muscles. For 40 years, our parliament has been subjugated. It's been usurped by Brussels. And, you know, it, it's like it's like someone who's getting back to the gym. It's a bit painful at first and you don't really <laughs> know what you're doing. Muscle memory comes back. Your muscle memory eventually comes back and then you're winning the race. Are you a natural rebel? I mean, how how hard was it to be a, a Spartan? You don't I'm, seem like I'm, a naturally rebel to I'm me. Not, I wasn't naturally a rebel, no. And, and you're right, I've got this uh, reputation for being a rebel now because of holding out on Meaningful Vote 3. In many ways, I found it the most difficult decision I've ever made in my professional life. I felt the conflict between party and country. Doing the right thing for my country, for me, was to keep voting against that deal. It was Brino. It was not Brexit. Brexit It was a sellout, exactly. Uh, And it was a falsehood. But my party, the pressure from the party was immense and forcing me in completely the opposite direction. So I was really torn. And within Parliament, it was very, very hard. But the guiding motivation for me was a profound faith and perhaps a blind faith, that's always dangerous, but a profound faith definitely in our democracy and in our parliament to deliver. I knew despite the travails of 2019, despite the crisis, despite the deadlock, I knew that ultimately this parliament with its history for democratic politics, for its history for innovation reform in terms of individual rights, the rule of law, limiting excessive power, I knew that it wasn't going to start failing in 2019. And I knew by hook or by crook, Parliament would deliver on that democratic instruction of 2016. Just a step back, you're the daughter of immigrants to this country. Should we be proud of the British Empire here? In my view, I am proud of the British Empire. I am informed by the experience of my parents. They were born under the British Empire in the 1940s. And they have nothing but good things to tell me about the mother country, actually. Uh, not least the fact that it was Britain that gave them opportunity and safety uh, in when they were young adults. But when they were children, they uh, saw the good that Britain had done for their respective countries. The British Empire was a force for good. Of course, of course, that's not to deny, you know, yeah. definitely. Uh, there's you light know, and shade in history. There's light and shade, exactly. The, the, the uh, awful things as well that, what, that went on because of the time period and and cultural norms at, at that time. But overall, I, I believe the British Empire was a force for good, I, something I'm incredibly proud of. So why is it seen of. as an embarrassment by so many people? I think, again, it's born out of a, uh, a left-wing apology for patriotism and an and apology for Britain, a belief in the declinism of uh, Britain. Uh, a small view of Britain that we are uh, somehow insignificant and wrongdoers rather than a generous view of Britain in terms of what we brought to the world. Uh, how do you see the party at the moment, your, your party at the moment? Has it run out of ideas? Is it teetering? 
No, I, I mean, you I, have got an 80 seat majority in the House of Commons. I mean, let's just get back to the democracy of what's going on. I mean, it feels like it's a bit, it's not there half the time. I feel we actually are seeing a renaissance. Uh, of conservative principles, of common sense principles, sound conservative things. But you're not cutting taxes yet, Philip Raven, are you? I would love to cut taxes. I am a low tax Tory, uh, absolutely. Apparently, you all are, but you're not cutting taxes. I mean, everyone's a low tax Tory, apparently, when, when they come to the pub. And I know the Telegraph is sorely disappointed <laughs> about uh, the the tax approach at the moment. Um, I think the the reasons are, you know, we had we had a global pandemic. We, we paid wages for millions billion. of people <laughs> in an unthinkable way. That, I mean, you know, I'm proud of that. That was the right thing to do. You know, I still have in fair and people who are lifelong Labour voters who cross the street to shake my hand because they're forever grateful for the loans and I mean, the grants. You know, do you want to see 2 PR off income tax by the next election? I, 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 I want us to um, definitely reduce the tax burden, to free up businesses, to ensure that people are keeping more of their hard-earned cash uh, and that they have uh, agency over how money is used, not ministers. I, I am confident we will get there. We are dealing with the aftershock of COVID. We've got global inflation pressures out of our control. We have to manage a, a steady ship in choppy waters. Boris Johnson... Do civil servants get him? I mean, is he the kind of, he's a kind of disruptor, unconventional private life, slightly chaotic, but that's what everyone knows he is. He is who he is, isn't he? Boris is a, a remarkable politician, a conservative who won London is remarkable. That, that result in 2019, phenomenal. It exceeded my expectations as well, and I'm an optimist. Fixing Brexit, getting it done – dealing with COVID. I think when history looks back on how Boris led us through COVID, I think uh, it will be positive, actually, when you look at the vaccine uh, rollout and when you look at how we have come out of lockdown and how our economy recovered faster and sooner than other countries because they were too fearful and they remained in lockdown for too long. So, and then lastly on Ukraine. So I think you've got in Boris a uh, once in a generation kind of leader. And he's not going to go anywhere? I hope not. Will he certify next election? Yes. How about you? Do you want to be leader? <laughs> that is incredibly kind of you to ask. And it's the honour of my life to serve as attorney uh, in this government. And as you can see, there's a lot for me to do. Um, and we'll, we'll keep going. And I'm, I'm very loyal to Boris, if, if that's not clear already. <laughs> I think everyone's going to no say, I'll turn her that. off. She's going on about Boris. I want Boris to continue as lead. I think I'm, I'm deeply loyal to him. I wish more of my colleagues were loyal to him and reflected and accept, acknowledged uh, his phenomenal achievements uh, for our party. Uh, I, I hope the people who have been concerned and upset with Boris uh, over leadership issues recently will appreciate they've had their chance to have their say and air their grievance and that they do now unite for the good of the country and get behind okay. it. Some quick fire re oh, questions no. just before we go on, on, on policy. Legalise cannabis? No. Bring back hanging? No. Legalise hunting with dogs? Um, I'm in favour of the status quo. Which is not. Now some easy ones. KFC or Nando's? Well, I am actually a, um, I don't eat meat. Um, so wherever I can get some fish or some good vegetarian food, which I think is Nando's. Coffee or tea, first thing in the morning? Coffee. Marmite? No. Ban it. <laughs> Ban it. Cream or jam, first on the scone? Cream. Ice cream or ice lolly? It's hot outside. No, ice cream. Ice, I love ice cream. I could live on ice cream. I... Swella Braveman, thank you for joining us on a busy day for you. Thank in you. In Westminster, coming to the pub and for Chopper's Politics. Thanks for joining us. It's been a blast. Swella Braveman there. Now do stay with us, listeners. Coming up, we'll be talking to Jake Berry, the chairman of the Northern Research Group of Tory MPs, about levelling up and his old friend Boris Johnson. Right after this. If you're finding this podcast interesting, you may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London, 
and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine, the latest, in the same place you're listening to this, and click follow so you don't miss an update. Now, alongside COVID, Downing Street lockdown parties are now Rwanda. Leveling up is another monkey on Boris Johnson's back. It's the main policy of this government, but few see it delivering in time for the next election. Not least Northern Tory MPs. And this week, a whole bunch of those blue wall Tory MPs are coming together in Doncaster for the Northern Research Group's first ever conference. Now, the NRG's chairman is Jake Berry, MP for Rossendale and Darwin. And he joined me this week in the Red Lion pub. I started by asking him why there was a need for this conference in the first place. Well, look, we want to show as a group of Northern colleagues, almost 50 of us with 400 Conservative Party members behind us, that we are the powerhouse, the Northern powerhouse almost, of good ideas for levelling up. The Prime Minister's defining mission will be levelling up. To win the next election, he needs to win the North, and we're going to help bring the North forward for him. Are the Troy party on side with this? Because, yeah, of course, no, you're an independent that, group outside the party. Yeah, we're, we're not an independent group without the party. We're a caucus within the party. And, you know, not invented here doesn't always mean unhelpful. Now, you might want to <laughs> just raise that with the whips. I'm not sure they'd agree. But I think the biggest danger for any government is to look like that it's run out of puff. And absolutely, we haven't. Leveling up is, is going to define everything we do. But you know what? For 40 years... I think Whitehall's failed the north of England. They've had a top-down approach that has seen the north-south divide grow. We don't want things done to us. We want to do things for ourselves. And this conference is about coming forward with those big ideas. We can't complain if Whitehall does stuff we don't like if they don't know what we want. So we're going to make sure they know what we want. How do you define levelling up? I mean, I think it's quite hard to define. It's in danger of meaning everything and nothing. But there's two tests I would apply. Is Number one, can you look out of your, your car window as you drive through where you live and see diggers and things getting better? And number two, do you feel more optimistic about the lives your children will lead in the area you live in? If the answer to both of those is yes, you've been levelled up. Mm, and it's a sense of place too, isn't it? So trying to stop people having to go south for work. Yeah, I mean, that's the car window test, isn't it? I mean... For far too long, people who live in the north of England and other areas, Cornwall, the Midlands, the the southwest, we've been kind of prisoners of our own geography. And the only way to escape that is to get on a train or get in a car and go somewhere else to have those life opportunities. We're going to reverse that. And that's what tomorrow's conference is about. Do you want to see a northern minister, i.e. a minister for the north, in the cabinet? Well, there is one. It's it's Grant Chaps, who's the Northern Powerhouse Minister, the Prime Minister. He's from Welling Garden City. Uh, well, I think I think that's that's north of London, certainly. But um, <laughs> he's a great man. The Prime Minister committed to it in his leadership election, along with all other candidates who are seeking to become the leader of the Conservative Party. The reason it was called for with one unified voice by all our Northern media outlets is because it matters. Mm. And it does matter. You know, it's it's a promise. I know and believe that our Prime Minister will continue to keep but i do think having a standalone person without a, another job being transport minister is a big job there's mm. you know we're going back to the 1970s and our railways large parts of the north have been stuck in the 1970s till we scrap the pace trains but we are going back there and i just think that standalone position is really powerful because you were the northern powers minister weren't you? i was i loved it i went to bed thinking when i wake up in the morning what can i do to make the north great again and i woke up in the morning thinking well what can i do today that will, will change people's lives and I, and I just think that sort of focus is what is required if you're going to deliver leveling up you look at the money flowing north to scotland where they benefit in, in scotland by far more than those in northern england you look at that differential just north and south of of the tweed Chris, How is that like on every issue, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Let's not forget, spending in London is 15% higher than other parts of England, let alone Scotland and Wales. And if we'd have spent just the same on transport in the north of England over the last decade, where I might add, we have been in power, we would have spent an additional £6.5 billion per year 
on transport infrastructure. And look, that's why today we're calling for what we call the levelling up formula. It's a bit like the Barnett formula. I don't know, maybe we could call it the Boris formula. He might quite <laughs> like that, the Prime Minister. And it's an idea that when, as we are doing, you set out those 12 long-term missions in law, putting things in law isn't the same thing as doing them. And you can't deliver those 12 missions without having a radical long-term plan to fund them. And that's why we're calling for this levelling up formula, which like the Barnett formula, would equalise funding across the UK and make sure that Northern taxpayers, after all who are paying for this, right, and taxpayers elsewhere in the country, get their fair share of funding. And one of the criticisms of the Northern Research Group is we have too great a focus on the North. I mean, I'll take that, right? I'll never apologise for it. But the idea behind a levelling up formula is it wouldn't just benefit the North. It would see more money spent in Cornwall, the Midlands, the South West. And it would also be an opportunity, if the government chose to take it, to revisit the Barnet formula itself Ooh, yes. and look at equalisation of funding across our United Kingdom. Because we can only level up this country when we level up funding in every area to make sure people I get I think even Lord, Lord Barnett, uh, when he drew it up in 1979, didn't think it'd last this well, long. Well, you know, it's a legacy issue. I mean, Lord <laughs> Barnett, we talk about it. So if we call this the Boris formula, it, <laughs> yeah. could, be, it, could, it could last for 43 years. <laughs> it'd be legally binding on the Treasury, would it? It'd be legally binding spending rules it, it were to exist, this formula. Look, I mean, we're a group of backbench coll- colleagues. We are pushing this idea. The detail is for our friends in okay, government but you, to you work got, out. But, you have but our, our vision is for it yes, to be legally you have got a, you've got a friend in if government. You, if you give the Treasury any wiggle room, they'll move back <laughs> to a positive feedback loop that always invests money in London and the South East. That's what we want to break, and that's what this You are very well do. connected. You have friends in high places, but you, you know the, the Boris Johnson. You're one of the original three or four amigos when he was in opposition. I know that. You also know Rishi Sunak. He's MP for Richmond. He's in the north of England. He's also Chancellor. What do you think of this idea? Well, both of them are coming to our conference, Rishi in a a private capacity to talk to colleagues the night before. Let's let them see the policies and then let's see how they respond. But I do know that both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are absolutely open to looking at ideas that colleagues come up with because we are, you know, broad church, the Conservative Party. I wouldn't expect a guarantee that they're going to do them, but let's see what they say. Do you approve of the CCHQ idea of this 80-20 strategy for the next election? They want to hold on to the 80 most marginal seats and win 20 more. Most of those are in the the north. Is that possible? Absolutely, it's possible. I mean, we had the best election results, I think, ever in the north of England. But what we have to remember is these brave voters who did what they'd never done before and broke their tribal loyalty to vote Conservative, they want to see delivery. We as a government need to be as brave, in fact, as the people who voted for us to deliver levelling up. So if we do that, I think absolutely we can hold those seats in the north. And yes, we can add not 20 across the country. I think we can add 20 in the north. That should be our strategy. But with things like our levelling up formula, which is fair for the whole of the UK, we can start to have that conversation which says, look, we're not focusing on the north to the detriment of Cornwall or the Midlands or the southwest or anywhere else. You know, it's about levelling up our entire nation and uniting it at the same time. What do you say to supporters in the south of England, the traditional heart of the Tory party, who worry about this focus on the north? I think it's great to spend more money in Darlington and Doncaster, but what about new potholes in Woking and Dagenham? The south east particularly is a huge net contributor to the exchequer. And most areas we're talking about in terms of levelling up are actually taking money out. So if we want our economy to fire on all cylinders, I want the northwest of England, Yorkshire, wherever it may be, to pay its full part. And there's two benefits for people who live in the southeast. If we all start paying more tax in other areas of the country, maybe they could pay a bit less. And we're all paying far too much at the moment, by the way. That's a, a, for another day. And the second thing is, you know, if you look at that Oxcams arc where the government was seeking to build a million houses between Oxford and Cambridge, that's hit huge local opposition. Do you know what? I get it. I get it. if you live in a nice place, you don't want to see it concreted over and, you know, Barrett houses or any other type of houses built around you. Come and build them in the north. But in order for us to be able to afford those houses and live in with our families like we want to do, we've got to have good jobs. And then so if you level up the north, you take the heat to some extent out of the south. And I think that's something people in Woking and, and other areas south of Manchester would welcome. But, but the people in the north also might fight development. I mean, it's a beautiful part of the, of the north. 
Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, development should always be in an appropriate place. But if you look, for example, the government's ring road that is funded through the Housing Infrastructure Fund, which will see thousands of houses built in Carlisle, John Stevenson, the Member of Parliament for Carlisle at the last general election, had that on his leaflet. Yeah. He was campaigning to build more high-quality houses in Carlisle. I don't think you'll see that in any Tory leaflets in Oxfordshire. Bon Boris Johnson, do you detect more support for him in the north than the south? Post-party gate, post all the various uh, issues that have hit his government. So, so there's two things that have happened recently. I, um, number one is the vote that we had in Parliament, and I think that the red wall, for want of a better term, held firm. Yes, some colleagues expressed their dissatisfaction, but the vast majority of our colleagues held together. And secondly, and when he comes up to our conference today, I think he'll be uh, overwhelmed by the reaction. There's a huge wellspring of support for him. But, you know, as my old mum used to say, handsome is as handsome does. And it's time to stop talking about levelling up the North and start doing it. And that will be the battle cry of our conference. And I think the one we hope the Prime Minister will take on board from his supporters in the North. We've got to start to get on with it. There's two years at most till the next general yeah. election. Talking about things isn't the same as delivering them. Let's let's get on with You've it. You've got 400 members uh, going to this conference. Will he get booed, do you think? No, I'm sure he won't. We've got 400 members of the Conservative Party and businesses as well. Because you know what? The other thing we haven't spoken about and we don't talk about here in Whitehall is that politicians can and will never deliver levelling up. We get it in the North. It's a team game, and that's why we want to bring businesses with us on this journey too. But just finally with Boris Johnson, we're talking in a week when Lord Guy has resigned as his ethics advisor. Alex Allen went a couple of years ago. You know him better than most. Is the problem here at the heart of it that he just won't change? He always has played fast and loose with, with all rules, and therefore... Anyone who's near him trying to impose ethics won't be his ethics, so that person can't last long in that job. Well, I haven't seen the reason for Lord Guy going, but what I would say is that I think Northern colleagues in this conference will demonstrate is we want someone who takes on the status quo. We want someone who is brave enough, brave like their voters, and will say, just because it's always been done in this way, it doesn't mean this is the way it should always happen. And that's why I think you see that wellspring of support for the Prime Minister, because, you know, he is someone who's prepared to break the vase or whatever it may be. And I think Keir Starmer's got a really interesting summer ahead of him. He's in a real mess about this sort of summer of discontent made glorious winter by the son of Islington. And, uh, you know, he is, he's, a, he's a lefty lawyer who needs to work out whether he backs the British people who wants to go to work or he backs the trade unions, whether he backs the British people in the government who want to send illegal immigrants to Rwanda or whether he wants some appointed judges in Europe to overrule us, whose side is he on? And in my view, he's not on the side of the British people. And you know what? That will be smelt by the voters in the North and it stinks. So let's see where we get to. And just finally, we're looking into a big week next week for by-elections. Will the Tories win both Wakefield and Tiverton and Honiton? Well, look, I, I don't predict elections because I'm very bad at it. I'm almost as bad as you are, actually. my forecast. Misery, but I haven't been to Wakefield yet. I'm going this weekend. I'm going to go over there with a load of my activists. I've spoken to lots of people who've been. They seem very positive about that levelling up message, cutting through the support for the Prime Minister. And Tiverton's, a, I think my ears might pop if I went that far south. So I'll leave, I'll leave that to other colleagues. <laughs> Jake Berry, enjoy your conference and best of luck. Thanks for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Great to have you on. Thanks, Chris. Well, that's all for this week, listeners. I'd love to know your thoughts about what our guests have had to say. Are you worried that the ethics advisors quit number 10 Downing Street? Is Jake Berry right about levelling up? You can email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or on Twitter, we're at Choppers Podcast. And for more from me, please do sign up to my daily Choppers Politics newsletter bringing you Westminster Insights straight into email inbox every weekday. Sign up at telegraph.co.uk forward slash politics newsletter. And be sure to check out my weekly Peterborough Diary column out at 7pm on Fridays on the Telegraph's website and in Saturday's brilliant newspaper. Thank you to my guests once again, Swella Braveman MP and Jake Berry MP. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wales, Giles Gear. Elliot Lampitt and Theodora Luludis. And as ever, thank you to you for listening. And finally, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph if you can. I know you won't regret it. 
Until next time, though, cheerio.